Good afternoon. This is the second day of spring, and I guess most of our colleagues are out looking for daffodils or something. But uh, uh, each week, there's somewhere between 200 and 400 people here at NIH who are online. So I will send everybody, the speakers, uh, the number of who actually are watching. So don't think you have a very select audience here. Uh, that's true, but there's a much larger one out there. And those who ask questions, I would ask if you wait a minute till we give you a microphone so people out there can hear the questions. Otherwise, they send me emails saying, I love the answers, but tell me what the question was. <laughs> uh, so I guess virtually everyone who's here has been here before, so we don't have to explain what that is, except for these two ladies here. Do you know what that is? That's right, the Brooklyn Bridge. And you know why we show this at this demystifying medicine? Because we are on that bridge and we're connecting, as it were, two worlds of science. One a clinical world and the other call it a more basic world, but that's not really a good word for it. But it's always been the objective to bring people together from different disciplines uh, to share their knowledge and ideas and stimulate one another. And that's what's going to happen today. Now, whoops, what did he do? Oh, no. All right. <laughs> So we've had a series of these. You had the wrong one up, but it's okay. We have a series of uh, these sessions in this course this year uh, dealing with inflammation. And it's covered six different uh, aspects of it. Most of it uh, is dealing more with acute inflammation and a bit with uh, immune-mediated inflammation. But today the focus of attention is on a very uh, prevalent uh, uh, consequence of inflammation. In fact, it's actually part of inflammation, uh, and that's fibrosis. And fibrosis is on one hand, wound healing is on another hand. The mechanisms of one are prevalent in the other, but they go out of control under different circumstances. Now, I have one other question, and that is, what do you think is the biggest challenge, the biggest discovery that's been made in the past 50 years dealing with the question of cirrhosis of the liver? Any takers? Well, you don't know what I'm thinking, but Harvey, do you have an answer? Well, yeah, what's been the biggest progress in the past 50 years dealing with cirrhosis? Get rid of viruses. Actually, the interesting thing, and the reason I point in that way, is it was only, it was about 50 years ago that cirrhosis was equivalent to alcoholism. It was somebody who had cirrhosis, was a chronic alcoholic, and therefore, what are we doing? Uh, and, and therefore, that was a closet disease. It was sort of like epilepsy, you know. You, sh you didn't talk about it if someone in your family actually uh, had alcoholic cirrhosis. And of course, that's dramatically changed. That's the biggest advance in the past 50 years. And many, 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 you're gonna hear about some of them. Now, one of the big things, consequences of that, which now the public is aware of, increasingly is that cirrhosis is a disease of all ages and of multiple discipline, multiple mechanisms, uh, of which alcoholism is a part, but the scope has expanded enormously. And of course, the scope includes viruses, particularly hepatitis B and C. Uh, it includes inheritable diseases involving iron like hemochromatosis, copper like in Wilson's disease, immune mechanisms like in various autoimmune forms of chronic liver uh, disease. There are drugs that can give rise to this and certain environmental 
toxins under some circumstances. And then there's a whole bunch of inheritable disorders affecting young children in which, ah, okay, well, we're there. And the last one is biliary obstruction, which can be mechanical uh, or it can be of other etiologies, some inheritable and, and some not. So what are the challenges? So these are the things I think of, but I hope that those of you who are not will think of others too. So one of the questions is what converts this normal wound healing response to actually produce a disease, fibrosis of the liver we're talking about? And how do we know if somebody has fibrosis? Uh, can we quantify it in any way? Can we measure it? Can we detect it? And the big thing of enormous interest these days is, is it preventable? Is it reversible? And there are many, many other questions that arise, but they all arise because of this bridging between definition of the diseases, the mechanisms, and so forth, and the underlying processes, which then lead to the possibility of understanding these questions and others. So we are very fortunate in having two experts here at NIH at both ends of this, uh, sides of this spectrum. And uh, the first speaker is going to be Theo Heller, who is a tenured clinical investigator in the liver disease branch of NIDDK. Uh, he graduated from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa in medicine, took internal medicine residency in Georgetown, a fellowship in viral hepatitis here at NIH, a gastroenterology fellowship at the University of Maryland, and then a liver disease fellowship here at NIDDK. Now, Theo's interest has been in chronic, particularly in chronic liver diseases, understanding their nature, their mechanisms, and their clinical aspects with regard to treatment. And then our second speaker is Tom Wynn, who received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in microbiology and immunology. Uh, he is at the NIH. I know he's the director, or was, is of the Ca Oxford Cambridge uh, uh, program, a very exciting program that brings young budding scientists uh, uh, here. Uh, he's a senior investigator in the immunogenetics section of NIAID. And his main interest has been in this question of how sort of wound healing leads to uh, fibrosis and the mechanisms involved therein. So we're very grateful to both of you. And Theo, perhaps you would begin. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to speak very broadly today. I'm going to speak in terms of the 30,000 meter view of cirrhosis and the progression of liver disease to cirrhosis. You can interrupt me and ask questions. We can make this informal. Feel free to ask anything. Well, not anything, but almost anything related to liver disease. And we'll see how far we get. I wanted to start with a patient. I actually asked two patients to come today. The first one is 86. And he's very interesting because he had Hodgkin's lymphoma in his 60s, was transfused, and developed hepatitis B, developed cirrhosis rapidly, and then was treated here at the clinical center, and his cirrhosis reversed. And now his biggest problem is his diabetes. So he said, what will I sit there and talk to a bunch of PhDs, and they'll say to me, how's your diabetes? I don't have liver disease anymore. The other patient is the patient I'm going to present. She's a 32-year-old mother of two, and she has a disease called primary scler sclerosing cholangitis autoimmune hepatitis overlap, for which there's no treatment, no, absolutely no cure, and the time from diagnosis to death is about 12 years. And she comes to clinic with her daughter and her, with her two sons, and her, she has an identical twin sister and they, a mother, and they often come together as a family. She likes having her nails done. She, pretty normal in many ways, has a job as an administrative assistant. And this is, for as long as I've followed her, 
these are her, what we call liver associated enzymes. So some of you might think about this as liver function tests, but I'm gonna show you why these are not liver function tests. This is what we call ALT, and you can see from 2005, going all the way through, she's been elevated. This blue line there is the upper limit of normal, and you can see she's persistently elevated. And I think if you ask most people, there's no significant change in that pattern. There's some ups and downs, but it's always elevated. Another liver-associated enzyme that we follow, which is important in primary sclerosing cholangitis, and has been thought of as a prognostic marker, but I really think is not, is the alkaline phosphatase. And you can see here too, it's been elevated, persistently elevated, but no real change. So this is what most people call liver function tests. And you can see the absolute stability over time. I'm gonna show you two more tests. The first test I'm gonna show you is something called prothrombin time. And one of the many, many, many functions the liver has is to make coagulation factors. And the coagulation factors help make up the prothrombin time. And you can see she started off stable, but then most recently, she's, that's a straight line up. And so she comes to clinic and we look at the curve and we say, mm, that's not good. But don't have much more than that to say as her liver fibrosis. I'll show you one. So this is a synthetic test. This is, I'm gonna come back to this. This is something the liver has to manufacture. We call these synthetic function tests or liver function tests. The other thing I'll show you are her platelets. And you can see for many years they were stable, but then starting in about 2012, they started to decline. And here too, there's a straight line down. Platelets are probably better predictive of portal hypertension. And we're gonna go talk about portal hypertension in a minute. But I want to point out to you that the synthetic function test, the prothrombin time went up in 2014. The platelets started to drop in 2012, a good two years before. So the, there's, it's not hand in hand. The disconnect, there's a slight disconnect between the pressure in the liver and what we can, what we can measure as a functional test. Okay. Any questions about her or what I've said? So why should we care? Why care? Well, I care a lot about chocolate because it makes my liver quiver. And we know that dark chocolate is good for you. Coffee is very good for you. Caffeine is very good. But we should care about liver disease for more reasons than just the side bits and the factoids. We care about liver disease because globally it's an important issue. If we look at the numbers, there are about 170 million people with hepatitis C. Depending on who you read, 400 to 600 million with hepatitis B. A couple of hundred million with schistosomiasis. Add in a few more million with other liver diseases, all the other variants, and pretty soon you're talking about more than a billion people. And if you think that the world global population is a little bit over 7 billion, you're talking about a big percentage of the world with liver disease. If we think about it a little bit sort of one step down, and if you go to the CDC website, and you look for cause of death under 50. The commonest causes are homicide, suicide, actually car accidents. But the first traditional medical disease as a cause of death is liver disease in people under 50. And if you go a little bit deeper than that, so some, I, get, I said this to someone once and they said, okay, that's in America. A lot of people use drugs and drink in America. So I, I went to the, to the English equivalent of the CDC and actually it's the same. Same in Germany, same across Europe, and it's definitely the same globally. You had a previous session on hepatocellular carcinoma, and I can tell you as a medical student in South Africa, I saw teenagers with liver cancer. For society, it's a terrible thing because these are people who should be paying taxes. These are people who should be productive. These are people who should be functioning and helping to build and grow. They're removed from society. Think about the family. Think about my patient, the 32-year-old with the two small children. If she has a liver transplant, that would be pretty significant. If she died, those children will never be the same. And think about her husband left with those two children. That's in the United States. Think about in Africa or China or South America. Think about it globally. And I can tell you, in many cases, the children are alone. The children will never be the same. It's devastating. And on a personal level, if you think about it for her, she's 32, she got married, she has children, they've just bought a house, they have a mortgage for the first time, and then she dies. 
It's just terrible. It's devastating on so many levels at the most critical time in life. So if you think about a 90-year-old dying, there's no death with dignity. It's a terrible thing. A six-year-old dying is an unspeakable tragedy. But the impact of a mother or a father dying at the most productive time of their lives is immeasurable. So that's why liver disease is important. And I gave you the numbers. It's a global problem. And that's why I think it's important to put energy and effort into understanding it. So before we go further, we should just talk a little bit about what the liver does. So, okay, liver disease is devastating, but let's step back and say, what is the actual biology? What's the function of the liver? Many chores, not just making the bed and taking out the trash. It makes things. So what does it make? It makes a protein called albumin. Albumin is probably the most important protein in terms of oncotic pressure in the blood. Albumin is like a workhorse in terms of carrying electrolytes, solutes, multiple other drugs, proteins. It's a huge cargo container. It makes clotting factors. We spoke about that already. I'm just going to give you a few examples of each. It breaks down things, right? So, pack it, so you eat everything from the gut, comes up to the liver. We're going to talk more about that. And all of this food has to be packaged and then sent back out. Think about cholesterol. Think about proteins that are peptides that are broken down, vitamins, vitamin A is the biggest source of storage is in the liver. It has to package it, retinols, vitamin D gets metabolized in the liver, stored in the liver. Stores, we're speaking about stores, iron, vitamins, repackages. Think about HDL and LDL, right, in and out of the liver. So the same thing, cholesterol, just packaged in a different way. One is removing from the circulation, one is putting into the circulation. Cleans, so every drug we take comes through the liver, right? It's absorbed by the, unless it's intravenously. Comes in through the liver, gets metabolized, protects us. Think about the bacteria and the viruses that we're eating regularly, all the food, all the things that are in the food that we shouldn't be eating, coming up to the liver, and it protects us by detoxifying them. And most importantly, it's immune central, I think. Tom is not agreeing with me. <laughs> I'm teasing. Yes. Yes, lots of NK cells, and lots of macrophages. Maybe, I don't know if it's still true, more than half, less than half, but somewhere around that in terms of the body's macrophages. Barbara Rahman sitting there. Yes, we all agree. Immunology is probably one of the most important functions of the liver. And you can see why in terms of the geography. So liver function, when I was in medical school, we learned there were 19 functions of the liver. Now, someone recently told me there are over 500 described and I'm sure it will grow. What about the progression of liver disease? And I think the progression is particularly important because I, one of the things that really drives the progression is the immune system. And I think that's why it's fundamental also to understand the immunology, and Tom will discuss that. So we go from normal liver to diseased liver to cirrhotic liver to a liver with liver cancer. And this evolution is variable. Almost every liver disease will result in cirrhosis. Viral hepatitis, NASH, alcohol, autoimmune hepatitis. Dr. Eris gave us a list before. I'll just add to that that there are accelerants. So we know that if you have HIV and hepatitis C, it's not the same as having hepatitis C alone. So hepatitis C, 20% will have cirrhosis at 20 years. If you have HIV, 20% at 10 years. If you have obesity or drink alcohol or post-liver transplant, your hepatitis C will progress faster too. So we know that there are accelerants for, if you have two, two are worse than one. And how these accelerants work and how they manipulate or alter the immune system and the development of fibrosis is also interesting. So let's go through some basics. David Kleiner gave me all the histology. I'm going to just take you through, this is normal liver, and this is a portal vein over here. This is a hepatic artery, and this is a bile duct. And the sinusoids are not really clearly visible, but they lie between these cells. So what happens is the blood comes in with the portal vein. It's about 70%, 80% the blood supply to the liver. It's nutrient-rich from the gut, 20% from the hepatic artery. It can vary when you're fasting more from the hepatic artery, less from the portal vein. In a post-fed state, there's more in the portal vein than the artery. The artery supplies almost half or half or more of the oxygen coming to the liver. 
they mix just over here as they flow out. And that blood flows through the sinusoids towards the central veins and then back to the heart on a microscopic level. In the sinusoids, there's flow along the sinusoid of blood out to the central vein and adjacent to that blood flow on either side, there's what we call the space of this. And there's lymph or tissue fluid flowing backwards. So there's a countercurrent which comes back into the lymphatics. And the liver and the gut make about 80% of the body's lymphatics. Hugely interesting fact. And then this is cirrhosis. This is the other extreme. Over here, the blue bands are fibrosis. You see the blue, and you can see there's a regenerative nodule, regenerative nodule, regenerative nodule. And the definition of cirrhosis is the combination of regenerative nodules with surrounding fibrosis. And you have to have both to have it called cirrhosis. And you can see how deranged the architecture is, and you can see how difficult it would be for blood to flow out of these vessels through to the central veins and have that nice countercurrent system with the space of this. So what actually happens as you go from, what's happening in the body as you go from that normal liver that I showed you from here to here? What's happening? So let's go through that. So all the blood is in the gut. That's the spleen, for those of you who didn't go to medical school. Blood flows back from the gut, and it also flows from the spleen. And this is important. This confluence of the blood from the gut and the blood from the spleen forms the portal vein. And when we talk about portal hypertension, we're talking about high blood pressure in that vein. In the average person, that's about eight centimeters. And then we get to the most important organ in the body, and I'm not talking about the brain. The liver flows back out of the liver into the heart. And again, for those of you who didn't go to medical school, that's what the heart looks like. And you can have problems. What can go wrong? There can be a blockage in the liver, like in cirrhosis. So you can just look at that figure and understand what's going to happen, not just functionally. So the one aspect of cirrhosis is that the liver doesn't do its chores, which we went through. But another problem would be this portal hypertension. And you can see that as soon as you get a blockage there, what's going to happen? There's back pressure, back to the gut, back to the spleen, and the spleen will get big. And this is very important for a number of reasons. First of all, this back pressure to the gut makes the gut swollen. People feel nauseous constantly. They don't feel well. They don't feel hungry anymore. They eat less, which is not a good thing for a cirrhotic. And when the spleen enlarges, it sequesters platelets. The immune derangements begin to occur. And we get into the syndrome of what we call portal hypertension. And I'm going to show you some of the sequelae of that. Just to point out that you can have a blockage there too. So if you have a blockage between the outflow from the liver to the heart, it has the same effect. It doesn't have to be liver disease. So you could have heart disease and develop portal hypertension. You could have clots in the blood vessels coming out, like you see in young women taking the oral contraceptive, developing Bud Chiari syndrome. Or you could have congenital webs in the inferior vena cava and you'd have the same syndrome. You could also have blood clots in the portal vein or problem in the portal vein, and you'd have the same syndrome. So we think of portal hypertension with cirrhosis, and in the West, that's about 80% of it. But in Africa, with just a somiasis and disease like that, or in India, it's not only cirrhosis. And I think it's important to think broadly. So one of the problems to start to talk about the complications is that the blood is obsessed with getting back to the heart. It's absolutely obsessed. So there's neovascularization and there are new channels that form to get the blood back to the heart and circumvent the liver. And we're going to come back to this. So there are now two things happening. One is the liver doesn't work. And remember, it's immune central. Two is there's blood being shunted around the liver, which has all sorts of things, evil humors, which should be taken care of by the liver. This is what it looks like in the esophagus, and this is a common place for varices to occur, and this is one of our patients, and you can see these large veins in the esophagus, and they rupture and they bleed. About 20 years ago, the risk of death when that occurred was about 30%. Today, it's 
So we have made progress, but 15% is still a lot each time it bleeds. We've become better at controlling the bleeding, but not better at controlling the liver disease. And I'm showing it to you in this order because this is what happens to the typical cirrhotic. As they decompensate, so you first, the first thing that typically occurs is they'll have a variceal bleed. And there's actually a classification for decompensation which goes like this. Starts with variceal bleed, different prognosis if you've, that's all you've had. And then it goes to recurrent variceal bleeding and another complication, ascites. So this is an MRI of one of our patients. You can see the liver here. This, this is what's called the T2 MRI, and on T2, the fluid is bright. You can see this massive spleen. It's longer than the liver. The spleen would typically come to about here. So this is about twice normal. And all of this white on the side, all throughout the abdomen here, that's fluid. That's ascites. These black holes are huge vessels, collateral. And there's some collaterals here as well in the hepatic hilum. But this fluid, this ascites, occurs for a number of reasons. The blood vessels in the abdomen dilate as the blood vessels in the liver constrict. There's alteration in renin angiotensin in the system. They develop hyperaldosteronism, begin to accumulate fluid, sodium retention first, then fluid retention. And all those lymphatics that I was talking about become dysfunctional and that fluid leaks out. What's interesting is that most people will respond to a low salt diet. And then we use diuretics. And when people become refractory to diuretics, which can occur quite quickly, within a year or two in some patients, their two-year survival is less than 50%. So this is as bad as lung cancer. Infection is huge, to quote our president. It's probably the commonest cause of death today in cirrhosis. And the reasons why it's so common are really, not are really not fully elucidated, although we have some good ideas. So to tell you how common it is, if you go to an emergency room, any emergency room, and you did blood cultures on every patient in the emergency room, 3 to 5% will have bacteria in their blood. If you took cirrhotics, what do you think the incidence of bacteremia or bacteria in their blood would be? In the emergency room, sitting in the emergency room. It's about 30 to 50 percent. It's tenfold higher. And these are not patients septic shock. These are not patients who have low blood pressure going to ICU. This is any cirrhotic sitting in the emergency room. Two separate studies showed, came up with the same numbers, same ranges. And that obviously translates into death by infection and into septic shock. And if you just think about the immunology, I'm not going to go into it, but you can imagine the priming with constant bacteria in the blood. That must prime the immune system in many ways, and then when they do develop infection, it's much easier for them to become septic. Other complications, encephalopathy, also a later complication with ascites. Cytopenia is when the spleen gets really big, white counts drop, platelets drop, and osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is underappreciated, and I mention it just because post-transplant, we're not going to talk about transplant today, but post-transplant, in those who do well, Survive the initial transplant surgery, osteoporosis is a huge problem, and fracture is a huge problem. Any questions so far? The question is, why does the platelet count drop in liver disease? So we, took, we went to the statistician, we said we want to develop a model, how many patients do we need, and they gave us the number, and we found the number, and we did all the things that we were meant to do. So theoretically, the liver makes thrombopoietin, which is the stimulant that goes to the bone marrow to tell your marrow to make platelets. That's a function test. It's one of the more than 500 functions the liver has. But that goes later with the PT. And when people have measured thrombopoietin, which we did and we published, it goes up. It actually keeps going up until they decompensate. So the thrombopoietin is higher per platelet as disease advances, even though the platelets are dropping. If you correct for spleen size, it's still dropping beyond what you would expect. So then the other thought was, well, there's the shunting occurring. So there's this polyclonal gammopathy that occurs in people with portal hypertension. And platelets have FC receptors, and they've been co coded with the immunoglobulins. So maybe they're being opsonized better. So we corrected for the immunoglobulins. Did not make a difference. Still out of proportion to all of these factors. 
then people said, well, there are autoantibodies that form, but it wasn't related to autoantibodies. So we don't really know where the platelets go. I think they get stuck in the liver as the disease, as the fibrosis progresses, but that hasn't been shown. It's an, it's an, I think it's an important question because as we begin to understand more about platelet function and the role of platelets in disease development, because platelets are really packages of cytokines and messengers and things, and they're doing some impo really important chores, which is why they adhese and they get stuck in places. So the fact that they're dropping, I think, will likely have some profound implications, but we don't understand that. And the traditional things that are in Zach and Maboya and Schlesinger and all the textbooks, not in Arius' textbook, but in the other textbooks are probably incorrect. So in terms of, yes. I don't, I don't know the exact amount. The question is how much cholesterol does a normal human liver produce? I don't know the exact amount on a daily basis. And it doesn't, I, I don't think, yes, I don't, anyone else? No, I don't know the, oh. So in terms of research questions, I want to know why liver disease progresses. So if you think about a disease like primary biliary cirrhosis, neonatal disease, within weeks they have cirrhosis. And if you think about a disease like hepatitis D, 75 to 90% within 10 years. And if you think about hepatitis C, 20% over 20 years. And some people never. So why do different diseases progress at different rates? And why do some people, we go out for a beer together, I get the cirrhosis, he's fine. Why are we different? So there are two questions. Why does the liver disease progress at all, you could ask? And why doesn't it progress in some people? And why in some more than others? And these are the things that bother me, although I probably should be thinking about some other things, but when we talk about liver disease, we also have to be careful. It's the famous Bill Clinton thing. It depends what the definition of is is, right? So you have to ask, what is it that we're interested in? Do we really care if someone has cirrhosis? No, we care if they get sicker and if they die. Cirrhosis is just a way for us to label it. So we have to understand that cirrhosis is really a surrogate. So what are we measuring? How do we measure it? And when do we measure it? Are important questions when you speak about liver disease. And I'm going to try and give you a nuance to you, not completely, but somewhat nuanced of some of the issues related to this, so you can understand some of the controversies. So we've got lots of options. We can measure liver disease by biopsy. Well, biopsy depends how much liver you get. If you don't get enough liver, likely to understage or overstage. It depends which disease you're talking about. If you're talking about PSC, it's a patchy disease. If you're talking about hepatitis C, it's not patchy. Portal pressure measurement gives you global assessment of the pressure in the liver, but it depends whether it's prehepatic or hepatic or post-hepatic. Remember those figures I showed where the, where the problems are. Imaging, very reliable when you have very advanced disease, but not reliable when you have early disease. And you'd rather know early than late. Blood tests, I showed you how useful blood tests were, although they're used commonly in everyday practice and variants of that. People are developing breath tests, haven't proved to be reliable. And transient elastography is something I'll talk about in a minute. Let's talk about biopsy a little bit more. Oh, I think this is an important quote. So the, one of the big problems in liver disease is that when you see a patient, it's not helpful to say this is where you are now. You'd like to know where they're going. You'd like to be able to tell them what's likely to happen in the future. And I think that's very difficult. And that's often what we try and use a lot of these tools to do. There are at least three different ways liver biopsies are scored for fibrosis, commonly used in the United States. This is something we use called the Ishak scale, and it goes from zero to six. So you can see it's a continuum. This is cirrhosis. Everything before it is not. But is it that different? No, it's not. But we make that label, that distinction here, when it becomes a six. You can imagine it's very difficult for different pathologists with three different scoring systems to get homogeneity. Moreover, I spoke about shunting. We think about shunting occurring with cirrhosis, but actually studies by Everson and others have shown that shunting starts to occur here. He gives the figure of 2.7 on the Ishak scale. 
very difficult to use biopsies, you've got to make sure that it's long enough and the right disease. What about transient elastography? This is a beautiful concept. The stiffer something is, the faster a wave will go through it. So if I bump this, the wave will go to the other side faster than if I dropped a pebble in water. It would take longer to go across. So just based on stiffness, you can understand how fast the wave goes through, you can calculate how stiff something is. And what you do is you take an ultrasound machine, put it on the side of the patient, the liver is tethered, so it's uniquely suited to this. You can give a percussion wave, and then with ultrasound, you can see how fast it goes through. And I'm showing you two patients, two of our patients. This is a patient with a pressure of 5.5 kilopascal, and this is a normal wave. The wave takes over 60 milliseconds to get through the liver. This is a patient with cirrhosis, above seven, seven and a half is cirrhotic. Takes, the pressure is 19.1, takes about 40 milliseconds to get through. So this again is very good at separating mild from severe, but not good at the middle stages. It's the coolest fact, I think, fibrosis can reverse. It was first shown here at the clinical center by Daryl Lau and Jay Hofnagel. And this is a patient with hepatitis D. And remember I told you 75 to 90% cirrhosis in 10 years? And these are the same magnification, except for this first one, A. This is a bit of a lower magnification. And you can see the cirrhotic nodule with the dense fibrosis. And as you got treated, the blue becomes less and less to the point where he eventually became normal. And he eventually cleared his hepatitis D and his hepatitis B. It's also been shown for other diseases, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, PBC, autoimmune hepatitis, alcohol, and hemochromatosis. So this is not limited to hepatitis D. The reversal has been shown in multiple diseases. So when we talk about studying patients in the clinical center, I think it's important to start by saying patients are the reason to do research. It's not that we do research so we need patients. Right? You'll sometimes hear people putting the research above the patients. It's never the case. The patient always comes first. And the, our frame of reference is that first patient I showed you. That's why we're here, and that's why we do what we do. It's not, they're not here to serve us. So in my work group, we've taken two approaches. One is we've taken rare diseases and used a common approach. And the other is we've taken a rare approach to common diseases. And our search is for universal truth. I think it's sometimes a little bit like Don Quixote, and I'll explain. And our aim is to understand and ultimately halt progression of liver disease. This is an unusual disease. This is a rare disease. It's called nodular regenerative hyperplasia. And it's actually very common in the clinical center because amongst a lot of the rare diseases we see, like chronic granulomatous disease, Turner syndrome, PI3 kinase deficiency, um, I can go on, we see this a lot. And you can see here the nodule is. You see there's one, there's one, but there's no fibrosis. So this is a really interesting disease. This is portal hypertension without the synthetic dysfunction. So these patients get varices, they get ascites, they get big spleens, they get cytopenias. All the manifestations of portal hypertension, but their albumin, their bilirubin is normal. PT is normal. So they maintain the synthetic function, but still have the portal hypertension. So if you think about why people die with cirrhosis, they die because of ascites, because of infection, because of variceal bleeding, because of encephalopathy. Okay, liver cancer too. But all the others are portal hypertension. So here we have a model, a disease model, and I'm not saying that flippantly, where you can study portal hypertension without the confounder of synthetic dysfunction. So we think this is a very valuable way to utilize a rare disease and extrapolate to the bigger picture. Let's take a concept break. All gut blood flows through the liver. And we already spoke about infection being a common cause of death in liver disease, and typically with gut organisms. Microbial translocation from the gut is associated with advanced liver disease. And this biosis, or change in the microbiome, occurs as liver disease progresses. So we ask the question, does the microbiome and the response to it alter the course of liver disease? And what we're really trying to understand is, is there constant translocation from the gut to the liver and the liver clears it? 
Or is there only translocation occurring when the pressure increases and then it leaks out of the gut? Does the microbiome change, as published by Quinn? And then remember this question of what's the contributor to this translocation? Is it hepatic dysfunction or is it the shunting around the liver? Which is the bigger issue? And perhaps most important of all, we want to understand it before the liver processes anything. If you measure it out here, it's been through the liver. It's pre-digested. It's not authentic. So we wanted to try and get to the source. So we wrote a protocol to directly sample the portal vein. And you have to understand that you can access any vessel in the body, any place in the body. If you take a catheter through the arm or through the, through the artery in the arm or a vein in the arm, you can go anywhere except for two places. One is in the brain between the hypothesis and the pituitary. There's a vein that lies between two capillary beds. And the other is the portal vein because there's a capillary bed in the gut and then the portal vein and then the capillary bed in the liver. So if you really want to see what's coming up from the gut, you can't thread a catheter there because it lies between two capillary beds. You cannot get anything in there. So that, in that way, it's privileged. But we were very lucky at the clinical center because they had been doing islet cell transplants. And in order, the only place islet cells grow are in the liver. So in order to do islet cells, you have to access the portal vein. You have to get through the liver into the portal vein. And we had pre-existing expertise. This is the team initially for the clinical side of this protocol. There are many other people involved in many other aspects, but the clinical and the basic, this is Grace Zhang, Liz Townsend, Ohad Sion, Rabab Ali, Chris Ko. And the outline was to sample liver tissue, portal, and peripheral blood, place in the context of function, shunting, the microbiome, inflammation, and immunity. And for this, we got a bench to bedside award. And I'll just show you an example of what we do. And this is a needle placed about 10 or 15 centimeters in through a patient's liver. And we confirm that we're in the right place by injecting dye. And you can see the portal vein. And once we're in there, we draw about 150 ml of blood. And the design of the protocol was such, we took 30 patients with hepatitis C, we, would, we treated them, and then we repeated the same. So we did it initially while they had hepatitis C. We took a range of patients from early disease to cirrhosis, treated them, eliminated hepatitis C, and then repeated the same in order to try and understand what's happening. Another concept study is we took patients who have liver disease and sickle cell. These patients are getting bone marrow transplants, and with bone marrow transplant, their disease reverses, their liver disease reverses. So we use that as an opportunity to understand the reversal of fibrosis and the reversal of the liver disease and the collaborators are there. So we started with patients. It led to ideas and protocols and projects. Patients are the frame of reference, and ultimately we'd like to go back to the patients. Just as a plug for the NIH, I think we have a unique environment. We can lay down the road, and bench to bedside becomes irrelevant. It's not just a bridge, it doesn't matter at all. It's like ordering a CAT scan. You can check a cytokine level. We can go from the boutique to the broad, and it's an opportunity to learn about all end-stage liver disease and to search for universal truths. And we can do all of that while taking care of people who desperately need that care. A lot of people to acknowledge. I particularly want to mention Christopher Koh, Ohad Sion, who wrote that protocol, the microbiome one, How Allow, Devika, Kapuria, my, the lab chief and my mentors, Jay Hofnagel and Dr. Liang, and then my work group, in particular for the for all of this, for Bob Ali, Liz Townsend, and Grace Zhang. Thank you. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned cytokines. There are a lot of drugs used for inflammatory conditions that lower cytokines. Do these delay the progression of liver disease? I don't know of any clinical trials where they've been tried. I know that in alcoholic liver disease, people have tried anti-TNF agents, and pentoxifilin, for whatever that's worth, has been tried in all sorts of liver diseases, but hasn't really proven to be anything. But I'm going to let Tom address the cytokines, because 
that's really what he does. Can you expand a little bit on the osteoporosis associated with liver disease and whether it's only vitamin D deficiency and whether the replacement would compensate or the other components that we don't understand? I, th I think there are a lot of other components. I don't think it's, it's definitely not as simple as vitamin D deficiency. We do supplement vitamin D calcium and we put people on bisphosphonates we do, and we screen with DEXA scans. It's far worse, for example, in autoimmune hepatitis. And the more inflammatory liver diseases have far greater osteoporosis. So we think it's cytokine related too. Can I use that word? Any other questions now? Okay, we'll hold on and there'll be time uh, after Dr. Wynn speaks. Thank you very much, Theo. That was great. Yeah, that was terrific, Theo. Um, I was impressed by that statistic at the beginning about a billion people being impacted, in, uh, impacted by liver disease. Um, so I put up this first slide, it's a, it's a great segue into this, that actually almost half of us in this room are likely to ultimately die from some kind of chronic fiber proliferative disease. And this is actually a slide I've been working on for a while and you, you, you can keep adding things to this slide. Uh, diseases that affect different organs, uh, different origins. Um, it, it's really quite impressive the number of diseases that we study here at the NIH have a fibrotic component that's a major contributor to uh, progression of that disease. Uh, and as was mentioned, genetics can play in. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, the muscles become fibrotic. That's one you know, genetic example. Lots of different infections that we've been discussing today. Um, autoimmune diseases, many autoimmune diseases have a fibrotic component. A lot of toxins lead to injury of various organs, liver, kidney, um, heart, lung, et cetera. So a lot of causes uh, that can lead to fibrosis. And it's a huge unmet medical need. We have really the first two drugs ever for a fibrotic disease were just approved two years ago, uh, perfenidone and nintendinib, two drugs for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis were, um, were approved. Uh, and they show some, uh, some improvement, but patients are still progressing and they're still dying. So there's, there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of developing drugs that deal with this problem specifically. And this was also mentioned in the beginning, you know, there is this dynamic between wound repair and fibrosis. Of course, when tissues are injured, uh, the goal of the body is to repair those tissues. And we're actually quite good at repairing tissues when there's an acute injury. And it's a very complex process that involves uh, a lot of uh, various inflammatory mediators in various stages. And, and the immune response and cytokines uh, play a big role in this. And so the goal when you, when you have an injury, of course, is to restore normal tissue architecture. And as I said, we're very good at doing that in typical situations. It starts off with a clotting reaction, inflammatory mediators are made, activation of a variety of mesenchymal cells, fibroblasts, angiogenesis, angiogenesis, angiogenesis plays a big role. And then, as I said, is when you have acute injury, you have restoration of normal tissue architecture, re-epithelialization, restoration of that tissue. The problem really comes in this wound repair response is when it becomes chronic or repetitive, this cycle can get out of control and there's a new appreciation, particularly in liver diseases, that dysbiosis can be a contributing factor. Bacterial antigens getting into the liver, activating an immune response that can lead to fibrosis. And this process of wound repair becomes dysregulated, leading to fibrosis. So this is the good and this is the bad, that this is not horrible. And we can live with fibrosis for, for many months and, and years, uh, and, and in some cases a lifetime, and not really have too many ill effects. But over time, this accumulation of fibrosis can ultimately lead to organ failure, which will require um, organ transplantation, or, or will, uh, the outcome will be death. And there's this new idea, as Theo mentioned, that, that fibrosis is reversible. This is a dynamic process of laying down collagen and other matrix components. And it's thought that if you can get rid of the irritant, that eventually over time, it is a slow process, that that fibrotic healing, that fibrosis can eventually reverse. And there's a lot of excitement about the potential of exploiting the function of macrophages and monocytes that produce a lot of 
matrix metalloproteinases that degrade and, and regulate the extracellular matrix turnover, we might be able to devise strategies, immunological strategies, to try and reverse established fibrosis. And then over time, fibrosis is also linked with the development of, fib uh, development of cancer, and this is likely associated with this perpetual, this ongoing um, wound healing response that, that it can lead to, to cancer. And the connection there is still a little bit unclear. My group has been very interested in uh, immunological mechanisms of fibrosis, and I, I'm actually in the laboratory of parasitic diseases, and I've studied uh, schistosomiasis for many years, which is a parasitic infection that causes uh, liver fibrosis. And uh, a lot of helminth infections are associated with type two immunity, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of background in the next slide. Uh, and type two immunity turns out to be a, an important driver of fibrosis. And another important driver of fibrosis is TGF-beta. And these are really thought now to be uh, two of the key immunological mechanisms that, that lead to the development of fibrosis. And there's distinct immune responses that are induced that have either pro-inflammatory activity or, or pro-fibrotic activity. And just a little bit about uh, type two immunity. Type two immunity is a, a type of immune response that's distinct from type one immunity, which is, uh, tends to be pro-inflammatory and associated with cytokines like interferon gamma, which activate macrophages to kill microorganisms, um, IL-17, which has been linked with a lot of immune disease, autoimmune diseases. Type two immunity is associated with the cytokines IL-4, 5, 9, and, and, and 13, and a different class of cells are associated with type two immunity, CD4-TH2 cells, uh, type two innate lymphoid cells, uh, M2 macrophages or macrophages that have been activated with the cytokines IL-4 and IL-13 have a unique activation profile and have different functional roles than type one activated macrophages mast cells, eosinophils, basophils, all linked with, with type two immunity. And I've put here, you know, sort of the good and bad aspects of, of having a polarized type two immune response. So the good aspects of type two immunity are that it activates anti-helminth immunity. So a lot of the nematode and helminth parasites that people get infected with, uh, you get a development of a type two response, and this type two immune response expels those parasites from the body. Um, so that's, that's a beneficial aspect of type two immunity. It augments our barrier defenses. It regulates tissue repair and regeneration. It neutralizes toxins through the development of antibody responses that can neutralize toxins in the body. Suppresses type one autoimmune disease when you have over, overdone or out of control type one inflammatory responses. This is a major contributor of autoimmune diseases and there's been many studies that have shown that type two responses can slow or prevent the emergence of, of autoimmune disease. And a new and exciting area that, that type two immunity is also uh, associated with um, maintenance of a metabolic homeostasis in the body. So when people get obese, uh, it's thought that you develop more of a type one inflammatory response. This causes adipocytes to proliferate and expand. Uh, you get obese and M2 uh, T, uh, type two cytokine responses are thought to control that by uh, decreasing the type one inflammation and, and maintaining metabolic homeostasis. And, and, and insulin sensitivity. So the bad sides of, of type two immunity, when you have an overdone type two response, you, you, of course it's association with allergic disease. You have too many eosinophils, you have high IgE, you have an allergic response. Um, that's a downside to overdone type two responses. It can reduce protective type one immunity to many infections that require a type one re response to, uh, for expulsion or, or resistance to infection of type two immunity can reduce that immunity and you get more susceptibility. Um, it's uh, linked with the mobilization of immunosuppressive macrophages in tumors, it an antagonizes anti-tumor cytotoxic T cell responses. And sort of the downside of this role in tissue repair and regeneration, which we, we deem beneficial, when again, when those responses are overdone, they can ultimately lead to the development of fibrosis, which can become pathological. And this slide I wanted to include because it, it sort of uh, describes the, the current paradigm for the link between type two immunity and development of fibrosis. There's been a lot of interest in the past four or five years in innate lymphoid cells, which are an important source of, uh, of uh, two key Th2 cytokines, IL-13 and IL-5. Um, IL-5 is known to drive eosinophil responses, and eosinophils produce a variety of cytokines, including IL-13 and TGF-beta, 
which again are, are, are two of the key uh, uh, profibrotic cytokines. There's been a lot of interest in these upstream initiators that, that target these innate lymphoid cells, IL-25, IL-33, and TSLP, which are uh, produced by damaged epithelial cells. They initiate this whole wound healing uh, cascade, or they're thought to in uh, initiate this wound healing cascade by targeting these innate lymphoid cells and other innate immune cells. And they also feed into the activation of adaptive immune responses and the expansion of Th2 cells. All of these cell types, ILC2s, basophils, eosinophils, Th2 cells, and even mast cells are sources of these type two cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13, which are thought to uh, target the activation of macrophages, which um, this process turns on a wound healing phenotype in these macrophages. And these macrophages produce a variety of growth factors like platelet-derived growth factor, insulin-like growth factor, TGF-beta, and others that activate fibroblasts and induce their transformation from a, fi a quiescent fibroblast into a myofibroblast that uh, secretes more extracellular matrix. And so that's sort of the existing paradigm. And there's other, there's other nuances to this. This population can differentiate further into a regulatory phenotype that produces TGF-beta that can directly feed into a, a, a profibrotic response, but it also can induce wound repair and fibrosis by downregulating type 1 inflammation, which can antagonize the development of fibrosis. And these processes uh, between macro, these uh, pro-wound healing, pro-fibrotic macrophages can feed back between the fibroblasts that produce factors like CSF1, which cause these uh, macrophages to proliferate. So that's sort of the existing paradigm. Uh, of wound repair driven by a type 2 immune response. The macrophage uh, was thought to play a key role. So a little bit about the, the background of macrophages. There are uh, uh, many different phenotypes of macrophages. I'm just putting here three of the dominant phenotypes that people study, and this is because of the various mechanisms that are associated with these different phenotypes. There's inflammatory macrophages, which are activated by a variety of mediators, uh, danger-associated molecular patterns, PAMPs, interfering gamma, necroptosis is an activating factor. Even cholesterol crystal, uh, crystals can drive the activation of macrophages into an inflammatory phenotype. And then there's a, another variety of factors that can transition these macrophages into a, a, a tissue repair phenotype, and not, not only just Th2 cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13, but other mediators like IL-33, 25, 21, and lipids and fatty acids have also been shown to induce a phenotype that re resembles the phenotype that you see with IL-4 and IL-13. And these macrophages produce a variety of factors that target um, other cell types like fibroblasts and induce their differentiation into myofibroblasts. They can directly target um, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, et cetera, induce their proliferation, they produce VEGF that causes, uh, that can induce angiogenesis, uh, new, uh, new, uh, new blood vessel formation, and they also produce factors that are known to activate uh, stem cells and, and tissue progenitor populations that can, can contribute to uh, wound repair responses. And these macrophages can also transition uh, in response to additional stimuli like resolvins, IL-10, anti-inflammatory type uh, signals and induces those macrophages into a pro-resolving phenotype that have been shown to drive the development of Tregs that have anti-inflammatory activity, and they can also contribute uh, to wound healing responses. We, my group has been, in particular, interested in better understanding the role of this wound healing population in both tissue regeneration and repair, as well as in the development of fibrosis. And one way that we've been doing uh, to, to try and dissect the specific function of this alternatively activated TH2 cytokine activated wound healing macrophage is to delete the receptor on that population uh, that is required to induce that phenotype. So we've taken IL-4 receptor flox mice and crossed those mice with a pre-expressing animal that will deplete the IL-4 receptor specifically in macrophages. And here we used um, the lysozyme Cre. And we crossed those lysozyme Cre mice with the alpha receptor flox mice to specifically delete the alpha receptor on macrophages and decrease the number of M2 macrophages. So the, the, the basic question we're asking here is, what role do these M2 cells play in tissue repair and in fibrosis in various models? And I'm just going to show you one piece of data. Um, 
looking at the role of macrophages. And so the original hypothesis was that these cells would be really critical for the development of fibrosis. And what we actually found in these studies was that macrophages, in fact, look like they play a suppressive role. So when we depleted the M2 subset, and here we were actually only access successful in deleting or removing the uh, tissue resident macrophage population that expresses high levels of lysozyme. We weren't very successful at removing M2 monocytes uh, with this approach because they express, the monocytes express much lower levels of lysozyme, so they don't delete the IL-4 receptor. But it very effectively deleted the IL-4 receptor on the tissue resident or the liver resident macrophages. And in this case, when we got rid of those M2 cells, the inflammation got worse and the fibrosis got a little worse. There was really no impairment at all in the development of fibrosis. So it's suggesting that those resonant M2 cells were not critical uh, to the development of fibrosis, which was hypothesized uh, really for many years. So then we sort of went back to the drawing board because we, we had evidence suggesting that M2 cells, in fact, were not that critical. And these were all, all the studies I'm going to talk about now are studies that were done by a postdoctoral fellow, Trey Giesek, in the lab. And really, the, 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 you know, in thinking about these data, um, it, it became clear that M2 macrophages or macrophages were not the only cell types that express the IL-4 receptor. There are many different cell types in the body that express IL-4 receptors, including hepatocytes, cholangiocytes, fibroblasts, other, all these other cell types that participate in wound healing responses and, and need to be modified when, when tissues are injured. So we took upon this task of um, actually deleting the IL-4 receptor in other, very, uh, uh, other populations of the liver to see what impact the deletion of the IL-4 receptor on these other populations might have on the ability of that liver to repair itself. And the first studies that Trey did was, again, to cross the IL-4 receptor flox mice with albumin Cree. And with this Cree, we were successful in deleting uh, the IL-4 receptor in both hepatocytes and biliary cells, the cholangiocytes and hepatic progenitor cells uh, with this specific Cree. And what we did was we took advantage of the schistosomiasis model, uh, which is a model where, um, where uh, Th2 cytokines are known to play an important role in the development of fibrosis. And so now we have an animal that's both Cree negative and Cree positive, so deleting the IL-4 receptor um, in hepatocytes and cholangiocytes. And the first thing we asked is, what, what impact does that have? So knocking out the IL-4 receptor on hepatocytes or cholangiocytes, what, what impact does that have on the development of fibrosis? And here we're quantifying that here by hydroxyproline. At 10 weeks and 18 weeks post-infection, you see the fibrosis is getting worse. There's absolutely no difference between the Cree negative and the Cree positive mice. The, uh, Trey has a very, uh, and this is picrocerius red stain, so this is by hydroxyproline, this is picrocerius red, all the red here is the fibrosis. You see no significant difference in the development of fibrosis. But Trey has a very keen eye, and the first thing he noticed, or what he noticed right away, was there a very big difference in the number of bile ducts uh, in these mice. And this is looking at 10 weeks and 18 weeks. You see in the, the, the control animals, the Cree negative animals, there's a, a large expansion in the number of bile ducts here. And this is the brown stain here. And then in the Cree positive, there's a big absence of bile ducts. So there's really no bile duct expansion in these mice during the infection, despite the fact that they're developing very significant fibrosis. And he could quantify that and, and, and show that these uh, bile ducts in the wild type sitting, setting were actually, the cholangiocytes were actually proliferating. So here he's, he's done a stain for EPCAM to identify the cholangiocytes, which is the epithelial cell population uh, in the liver and then KI67 to show that these cells are proliferating. You can see these uh, cholangiocytes are lighting up with the red stain here, showing that they're proliferating quite nicely in the wild-type setting, but there was very little evidence of proliferation of those cholangiocytes in the Cree-positive group, so their IL-4 receptor has been, de been depleted. Um, very little proliferation. This is all quantified here, just showing the, the, the decrease in, in the number of cholangiocytes, and ductular reaction. We call this expansion of the ducts uh, a ductular reaction or a duct, duct expansion uh, due to the infection. So we, we put together a little cartoon here uh, to try and explain these results. In the wild type setting, hepatocytes and cholangiocytes both express the IL-4 receptor. They respond to these cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13, and this induces fibrosis, but it also induces the expansion of, of these ducts. You get this ductular reaction, expansion in cholangiocytes, and this leads to this ductular reaction. Now, when we deplete the IL-4 receptor on both hepatocytes and cholangiocytes, we lose the ductular reaction, 
and, but we still have fibrosis. Well, these data were exciting to us because in, in the clinic, it's, it's these two processes, ductular reaction and fibrosis, are very closely linked. And it's actually thought that the patient, patients with advanced cirrhosis, those patients that develop a ductular reaction are the patients that are very close to needing a liver transplant. So it's prognostic for, for needing a liver transplant. And it's been thought for quite some time, although it's really unknown the mechanisms, that ductular reaction is very tightly associated with the development of fibrosis and vice versa. They were thought to be directly linked processes. So as fib your fibrosis gets worse, your ductular reaction is going to get worse. But what these data were hinting at was that you could get very severe fibrosis but have no ductular reaction. So it was a, the first hint that these processes might be very distinctly regulated and not necessarily dependent on, one, on each other. So what is ductular reaction? Just a little more background about this. Ductal reaction refers to an increased number of ductals, the finest ramifications of the biliary tree, often accompanied by inflammatory cells. And it's always, it's always associated with an increase in matrix that leads to periportal fibrosis and eventually uh, biliary cirrhosis. It's a phenomenon that is seen in most uh, chronic liver diseases. Patients with severe ductal reaction are at greatest risk of requiring a transplant. Um, it's associated with cirrhosis, as I've said, but whether it's a consequence of or a key driver of fibrosis has remained unclear. And ductal reaction has also gained new interest, um, at least at the basic level, because of its relationship with the activation of putative uh, human liver progenitor cells, which are important in tissue repair and regeneration. We went back to some, uh, to, so these, uh, these data suggested that during schistosomiasis, the alpha-receptor expression on either hepatocytes or cholangiocytes uh, were uh, important for the development of this ductular reaction. And our first question was, well, is that dependent on the cytokine IL-4 or IL-13? Both of these cytokines can engage the IL-4 receptor uh, and, and, and drive uh, the differentiation of, of, of Th2 responses and, and, and Th2 responsive genes. So we went back to some archival tissues and, and archival studies where we had uh, done schisto infections in either IL-4 knockouts, various receptor knockouts, et cetera. And the, and the conclusion from all these studies was that um, IL-13 was the key cytokine, and IL-13 signaling was the key signaling pathway driving the ductal reaction, and that IL-4 was playing uh, uh, much less of a role in this, in this ductal response. So we're now able to completely eliminate the infection and reproduce these, these same exact findings just by overexpressing IL-13 in the liver. And the way we went about doing this was to design a plasmid that would overexpress IL-13 and then just deliver that hydrodynamically into mice. The, the, the plasmid is taken up into hepatocytes. They overexpress IL-13. And this, is in, this induces a fibrotic response and a nice IL-13 response. And that's shown here. Uh, this is just a week after IL-13 delivery. We see this high IL-13 expression. It doesn't induce IL-4. There's an increase in collagen genes and increase in other marker genes like the IL-13 decoy receptor, which are induced in response to IL-13. We see this nice IL-13 response um, just with the plasmid overexpression. And we could reproduce a lot of the data that we, uh, we, we developed with a schisto infection. So again, high IL-13, high Col 6 a high fibrosis. This is the Picker series red stain and the Cree negative, and the, Cree the albumin Cree negative and the albumin Cree positive. You see fibrosis developing, very similar to what we'd seen with the schisto infection, when we look at albumin Cre positive, there's a lack of proliferation of the cholangiocytes in response to IL-13, and we see this massive cholangiocyte proliferation in response to IL-13 in the Cre negative group. So very reminiscent of what we had seen uh, with the schisto infection. So all of these data suggested that either um, for the ductal reaction to happen, that you need IL-4 receptor expression in either hepatocytes or cholangiocytes. And to really try and narrow that down, we developed a mouse. We crossed that IL-4 receptor flox mouse to a K19 Cre, uh, which will restrict the IL-4 receptor deletion to the uh, epithelial lineage. So this allowed us to specifically deplete the IL-4 receptor on the cholangiocytes, but not on the hepatocytes. And we did the exact same studies, um, both with the schisto infection and with the IL-13 plasmid. And again, very similar to what we had seen with the albumin Cre, when we looked at development of fibrosis in the wild type or the Cre negative and, and, and the Cre positive, uh, where IL-4 receptor expression is impaired in the cholangiocytes, no effect at all on the development of fibrosis. And that's shown here again quantitatively at 10 and 18 weeks post-infection. 
but very similar to what Trey had seen with the albumin Cree. Again, in the wild type setting, IL-13 is inducing a nice cholangiocyte proliferation. But now when we uh, knock out the alpha receptor on the cholangiocytes, those cholangiocytes no longer proliferate and the ductular reaction is almost completely lost. So these data said very nicely that expression of the alpha receptor on the cholangiocyte was critical for this ductular reaction and not on the hepatocytes. We knock it out here, we lose the ductular re reaction, but we don't lose our fibrosis. So again, data suggesting that these two processes are distinctly regulated by IL-13 signaling. So that's fine, that's the ductular response. What about the fibrosis? So we've shown that you can get ductular reaction or, or you can um, lose your ductular reaction in the face of having very significant fibrosis. What if you do the reverse? What if you have very little fibrosis but you have overexpression of IL-13? Can you still get ductular reaction in the absence of fibrosis? So to ad address that question, we crossed the alpha receptor flox mice with PDGF receptor beta Cre to specifically knock down the alpha receptor on fibroblasts. So now we're blocking the ability of fibroblasts to respond to the cytokine, but we're preserving the, act the, act the, the response in cholangiocytes and hepatocytes. And those data uh, showed very nicely that IL-13 or IL-4 receptor expression on fibroblast was critical for the development of fibrosis. And here again, he's doing the overexpression of IL-13. You see this increase in fibrosis in the wild type setting, and then a loss of fibrosis when you knock down the IL-4 receptor on fibroblasts. And that's also shown here with the particular serious red stain. You see all this red staining here in the parenchyma that you don't see in the Cre positive, quantified more over here. But most interestingly for us, when you looked at uh, the ductular reaction, here by looking at um, FCAM staining and, and KI67 staining, in both cases you see the cholangiocytes are proliferating very nicely in response to IL-13, despite the fact that we've knocked down fibrosis um, very significantly. So we think that these processes are very distinctly regulated. And this is interesting for us because this is really thought, this ductular reaction or this expansion in, in, in the ducts is thought to be a regenerative response in response to, to tissue injury in the liver. So we're both inducing tissue regeneration at the same time we're driving fibrosis, and these processes are going on simultaneously in the tissue following injury. Here IL-13 we think is targeting um, hepatic progenitor cells and cholangiocytes, driving their proliferation and differentiation into cholangiocytes. These uh, ducts um, proliferate uncontrollably, they become occluded, you develop cholestasis, and this cholestasis can eventually lead to um, the activation of a lipogenic program in the liver, and we, we see the development of steatosis in these mice. And whereas previously it was thought that these two mechanisms were related, as your ductular reaction got worse, this would contribute to the development of fibrosis, or fibrosis would induce the development of the ductular reaction, these data suggest that these processes are very distinctly regulated. And IL-13 is directly targeting the fibroblasts to drive the development of fibrosis. And, and just a few more slides just to show you the consequences of this and evidence for this uh, part of the story down here where this ductular reaction leads to cholestasis. When we look at these mice um, that have been challenged with just IL-13 and we have this massive proliferation of the cholangiocytes, these bile ducts can become occluded because of this massive proliferation of the cholangiocytes. And as the bile ducts become occluded, uh, you begin to get this backup of bile and you get the development of these um, bile crystals uh, in, in the bile ducts, which, which we see um, uh, routinely in these mice. And then, of course, you can uh, really best appreciate this. Uh, these are some um, resin castings that, that um, Trey did. Just in, basically inject a plastic into the bile ducts and you see these beautiful um, biliary tree uh, in the wild type setting. And you see these r r fine ramifications of the, of the bile duct here. And the wild type animals are, are injected with uh, uh, just a control protein, GFP. And now we inject wild type mice with IL-13. And they have this massive bile duct reaction. Uh, and he does his cast. You can only get really the common bile duct uh, in, in this casting. And you see this nodular regeneration of these bile ducts uh, on the, uh, the um, uh, the bile duct here, these, uh, this nodular regeneration that's uh, occurring in response to the IL-13 and this proliferation of these cholangiocytes. So it's really quite impressive. And the consequences of that, so you have this uh, massive uh, ductular reaction and these bile ducts getting occluded and this backup of bile, 
uh, leads to an activation of a lipogenic program in the liver. Because normally what bile does is it flows in the intestine, allows fats to be emulsified, and that's important for nutrient uptake. And when that stops happening, the, the result in effect is that you activate this lipogenic program in the liver. And that's what we're showing here. In the wild type setting where you have this bile duct obstruction, you get a lot of uh, lipids accumulating in the liver. And we don't see that when we knock out uh, the IL-4 receptor um, on the cholangiocytes. And we block this uh, bile duct reaction. So the, the, the conclusion of this story is that uh, the type 2 response has both roles in tissue regeneration following injury, and it has roles in the development of fibrosis. And that these processes are very uh, distinctly regulated, and there's many cell types that are targeted by this cytokine. And I think the story is true. I think that macrophages do play a role, certainly uh, by producing important growth factors that can lead to fibrosis. But we've shown that IL-13 and IL-4 receptor expression specifically on fibroblasts is very critical. If you just knock out the IL-4 receptor, on fibroblasts, you can very significantly decrease the development of fibrosis. But IL-13 is also targeting many other cell types, hepatic progenitor cells, which can differentiate into cholangiocytes, can directly target cholangiocytes and induce their proliferation. And, and A.J. Chawla's group has also shown that IL-4 can directly target hepatocytes and cause those hepatocytes to proliferate. And he's shown that following either partial hepatectomy um, or um, other types of injuries uh, to, to, um, to the liver that IL-4 can, uh, at least in the case of a partial hepatectomy, uh, very quickly um, a allow uh, livers uh, to regenerate, uh, to, to regenerate following that, that type of injury. And so I, I just wanted to end with just a couple more slides and say that you know, th these data do suggest that IL-13 uh, possibly could be uh, uh, a therapeutic target uh, for fibrotic disease, and, and that is being investigated in the clinic. There have been a couple um, humanized antibodies generated against IL-13, and we've been very interested in, uh, in our experimental models it, 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 trying to determine whether or not IL-13 is a good therapeutic target. And um, one thing that we've done, uh, is to um, use therapeutic antibody style 13 in the schisto model. And one thing that we found when we block IL-13, another function of IL-13 besides driving fibrosis, in fact, one of the earliest functions of IL-13 is that it's known to be an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So one of our concerns about blocking IL-13 chronically, even though it has a protective effect with fibrosis, is if we block IL-13 and we remove that anti-inflammatory activity, of, of IL-13, what effect might, have that, might that have on the efficacy of this approach? And this is just one piece of data I'll show you where we've used antibodies to IL-13 and antibodies to interferon gamma to look at this question, the profibrotic activity of IL-13 and its anti-inflammatory activity. And interestingly, what we find was, found was that when we blocked IL-13 during the schisto infection, it has a very nice effect at reducing fibrosis, but it doesn't have very much of an effect on blocking inflammation. And we measure inflammation by measuring the, the, the size of the granulomas in the liver. So no impact on inflammation, but there's a big decrease in the fibrosis. If we look at the type 1 inflammatory cytokine interferon gamma, block this cytokine has absolutely no effect on, uh, on the fibrosis, but it significantly decreases the inflammation. So one of the questions that we had was, because IL-13 is pro-fibrotic but anti-inflammatory, perhaps part of the anti-fibrotic effect of IL-13 is this emergence of an interferon gamma response, which is known to be antifibrotic. So to test that, we blocked both um, IL-13 and interferon gamma simultaneously. And what we were predicting when we did these studies was when we blocked IL-13 and interferon gamma in combination, we may actually lose some of its protective effects, some of the protective effects of anti-IL-13. But in fact, what we found was an even more protective effect. The fibrosis was even more significantly decreased and the inflammation that remained up in the, in the IL-13 blocked animals was very significantly re, uh, reduced when we blocked both 13 and interferon gamma. And these data were exciting to us because this was our concern. Okay, IL-13 leads to the development of fibrosis. We block IL-13, we may switch it back into an interferon gamma response that can also have ill effects, this, this overdone inflammatory response. What these data suggested was that actually blocking both the pro-fibrotic activity of IL-13 and the pro-inflammatory activity of interferon gamma simultaneously might lead us into a more protective response where we get tissue healing 
without the development of fibrosis. And additional evidence for that was when we looked at the mechanisms that are known to drive fibrosis on the Th1 side over here, which is TGF beta, was up in the absence of IL-13, shown here, but significantly decreased when we blocked both 13 and interferon gamma. So suggesting that we might need to block both of these arms to get an effective uh, antifibrotic uh, result. So uh, I was asked to say, you know, to, to conclude with, well, what do we know, what don't we know, and what should we know? So I thought this would be a good slide to end the talk. Uh, what we know is, is that IL-13 and TGF-beta are major drivers of fibrosis, but they also help, help facilitate tissue repair and reduce inflammation. And fibrosis is reversible if it's caught early enough. What we don't know is while TGF-8 and IL-13 are potential therapeutic targets for fibrotic diseases, what we don't fully understand is what impact long-term disruption of these pathways might have on normal tissue homeostasis and regeneration. And what we should know is how to slow the progression of fibrosis without impairing normal tissue homeostasis and healing, how to block fibrosis without causing uh, damaging rebound inflammation, how tissues regenerate following injury, we know very little about that, and the positive and negative impact of inflammation on tissue repair and fibrosis. I'm happy to leave it there. Take some questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. This was very extraordinary. Do we put some questions while folks are thinking? Uh, you know, it's interesting. This is the first talk that I've heard on uh, uh, the reversibility of fibrosis where the word collagen wasn't mentioned and where the emphasis was not on the pathways of formation of collagenase and basement membrane and, and matrix type proteins because that was the major direction uh, of attempts for therapeutics. And in many of the models, including mouse models, Schisto being the biggest one, uh, inhibitors <coughs> of collagen formation, particularly a compound called a zetidine carboxylic acid, which substitutes uh, carboxylic acid for proline in the synthesis of the collagen type 1 chain. And that's rapidly degraded by uh, collagenases, and so those animals don't develop fibrosis at all. The, the trouble is they develop some problems <laughs> regarding collagen formation in other tissues, which is the same kind of problem that you're dealing with when you're altering the immune system, the specificity with regard to, to, uh, uh, to the organ. Yeah. So I, I would ask perhaps both of you, uh, uh, and all of the activity related to reversibility or prevention of fibrosis, has the pendulum completely swung to influence of the immune system? Or is there a place for uh, <coughs> matrix proteins and their biology? Or shouldn't we be studying them? I, I, think, that, I think the pendulum is certainly swinging towards the uh, immune response. And are there avenues to intervene by blocking key profibrotic soluble mediators uh, that are associated with immune response. I think that is one area that's gotten really hot in many different fields of fibrosis or organ systems of, that people study to, to understand fibrosis. Um, but I think the other thing, getting back to your first point about matrix, there's this other idea that as organs stiff, stiffen, that actually can be a propagating mechanism to activate fibroblasts through integrin, integrin interactions, particularly organ, organs that are need to be flexible, by, by, like the lung and the intestine, are particularly sensitive to these kind of hardening effects. Whereas they move, the integrin act interactions can activate TGF beta, which can feed into the fibrosis. So it becomes sort of an inflammation independent physical process that activates the fibroblasts. Yeah, Luba. Luba. You have to use the microphone. Yeah, there's, pe there's people listening remotely, so they'd love to hear your question.
been end stage fibrosis, but the good story is that their early stages of fibrosis are very small. So I think there's two different things. Do you want to answer that, Theo? I mean, I, you know, my from experimental level would say that the longer you have a fibrotic process going, the longer it will take you to reverse that fibrosis, but it may still be fairly reversible, functionally reversible, that you, you know, you restore normal tissue or, or organ function. You may never get rid of all the fibrosis, but functionally you're in a much better shape. Theo? I would agree. I, you know, we've seen cirrhotics reverse. We don't see truly decompensated cirrhotics completely reverse, although there's evidence of decompensated cirrhotics becoming compensated. But the example I showed was a patient with real cirrhosis who went to normal on repeat biopsies. So we think it takes longer, exactly as you said, for people with well-established fibrosis to reverse. And that's been shown in multiple studies. So isn't that related to the difference between type 1 and type 3 collagen? Type 3 collagen is intensely cross-linked and yeah. resistant to right. collagenases. Right. So the three, the people talk about three things. The one is the longer the fibrosis has been present, the more the transition and the more the cross-linking. Right. The second thing they talk about is how dense the fibrosis is. It takes longer to get through it. And the third is that a lot of the metalloproteinases and things like that are hepatic function tests. The hepatocytes have to make them. So when you're really cirrhotic, you have far less of them. I think the other, the other issue, too, is that as you get more and more fibrotic, and this has been the mystery with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where people have said, oh, it's an anti-inflammatory disease. Because when you take a biopsy, all you see is this fibrotic scar in the lung. Well, what you need are inflammatory cells to come in there to allow that to remodel and reverse, right? If you don't have an inflammatory response, you're never going to be able to reverse it. So we need to understand how to use the inflammation to reverse the fibrosis. If we had the uh, ideal drug for reverse hepatic cirrhosis, would that same drug work in kidney fibrosis? Or would there only be two types of kidney fibrosis? I would say a lot of the experimental drugs that people are looking at have been tested in multiple organs, in multiple models, and have efficacy in multiple. There's a lot of interest in that that the, the drugs that are advancing more rapidly are ones that have shown efficacy in kidney disease, liver disease, and cardiac disease. Is that true in humans? Is that MMR? Have you seen that in Oh, come on. We, we, we've only tested a few drugs in humans. That's only happening now. Well, that's one example, right? I mean, we don't, that's the only one. I would also say that what's really interesting is that if you remove the underlying cause, if you can get rid of the viral hepatitis or you can eliminate the alcohol, that's the best way to reverse fibrosis. And that works very effectively in the liver, but I don't think it works as effectively in the lung. So when people stop smoking, you don't see the emphysema reverse. Right. Yeah, it's definitely the liver is much more regenerative than yeah. lung. So right, there's some. So. so I think the regeneration or the removal of fibrosis may be more organ specific, and may be uniquely related to the liver. I wonder that you did not um, mention the interaction between IL-13 and TNF alpha. Um, you sort of go directly to interferon response. So can you? Well, we've done, you know, in our models, we've done studies with TNF blockade or TNF receptor blockade and not had much luck with just blocking TNF. And when we block IL-13, and it was in that last, this slide here, so when we block IL-13 and we reduce the fibrosis, we actually see more TNF expression. We actually now think that what we're doing is we're activating an inflammatory response in the absence of IL-13, and that inf type 1 inflammatory response is involved with the activation of TGF-beta, which can now lead to fibrosis through the TGF-beta pathway. You can see this yin and yang going on between the type 2 and the type 1, with the type 2 IL-13 being a major driver and the type 1 TGF-beta being a major driver. So blockade of TNF-alpha simultaneously with blockade of IL-13 would produce similar effects? That'd be very interesting. I haven't done that. 
because the TNF alpha inhibitors are in wide clinical Correct. practice. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot of interest in combinations now. Combinations like that. Do IL-13 knockout animals survive? They Is do it much. Embryologically lethal? No, not at all. Yeah. So you have on your slide the role of IL-13 in cellular differentiation in the liver. Is that effective? Is it, what's the uh, phenotype if? of an IL-13 knockout liver? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, may, maybe that's, you know, TGF-beta is embryonically lethal, right? When you knock out TGF-beta, yeah. you can't do that. Um, so it's interesting to think that maybe this is an adaptive wound healing response that leads to fibrosis. It's not critical during development, but it's critical during life following injury. It's an adaptive wound healing response that's different than TGF-beta that has a role in an innate tissue development. Okay, well, listen, thank you very much, both of you, for making a very exciting bridge for us to talk.